breaking news tonight, a death threat to the Manhattan District Attorney who's investigating former President Trump. In just the last hour, we're learning about an envelope with white powder and a note that says, I will kill you. What else we've just learned in a live report next. Plus, dangerous storms are just getting started tonight across the South as millions of people face this double whammy of tornadoes and flooding, where it may be most dangerous, plus a forecast. And first on NBC News, our team is learning a radar system at a base in Syria wasn't working when an Iranian-backed group launched a deadly drone strike. What we're hearing from the Pentagon now. Plus, is celeb stan culture going too far? Two big name stars seem to think so. Why Selena Gomez and Hailey Bieber are asking their fans to chill out today. And why the era of big TV may be over and why you might be surprised where streaming players like Apple are putting their money later in the show. You're looking live, by the way, of one of the attorneys, Gwyneth Paltrow. There she is on the stand as we speak in that high-profile ski crash trial. We're going to have a live report coming up a little bit later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we're starting with some breaking news out of Manhattan, where law enforcement sources tell us white powder and a death threat has been sent to the office of the district attorney at the center of a key Trump investigation. You can see some things getting carried out. See those biohazard bags? That was not long after a letter was found. A letter addressed to D.A. Alvin Bragg, which says, and I'm quoting here, Alvin, I am going to kill you. Here's what we know right now. Whatever the powder was, it was determined not to be hazardous. The postmark is from Orlando, obviously suggesting the letter came from Florida. And right now, both the FBI and the NYPD are on the ground investigating. Let's get right to Laura Jarrett. What else do we know about this, Laura? Hallie, it's obviously a disturbing discovery here as the Manhattan District Attorney um, is hearing grand jury testimony, presenting witnesses and evidence to the grand jury in this Trump hush money investigation. Now, this letter, as you outlined, doesn't mention Trump by name, doesn't uh, mention anything related to a Trump investigation, but the timing, of course, all of this is sort of unmistakable. Uh, I want to read to you a comment, uh, really a statement from the District Attorney's Office. The District Attorney's Office is not talking a lot these days, so I want to read it to you in fall. The DA has informed the office that it was, meaning the letter, immediately contained and that the NYPD Emergency Service Unit and the NYC Department of Environmental Protection determined that there was no dangerous substance. So the substance itself not uh, posing any threat, but the message unmistakable. The, the security risks as we get closer to a potential possible indictment here, Laura, and I know that there is still sort of a wait and see mode on that front. We're not going to get any hints until the grand jury reconvenes again next week here. Um, do we know anything about, for example, boosted security for Alvin, Alvin Bragg? Does he have it already? What else can you tell us? So he has a detail already. That's okay. just as a matter of course, that's something he has for his protection. But I have to tell you, you know, uh, we've been reporting all week that this is just sort of a security nightmare all around for law enforcement. They've been working, uh, having meetings in behind the scenes, trying to figure out the best way to secure not only the building, the courthouse there, should Trump actually be indicted, but secure the participants, the lawyers, the judges, the court staff, everyone who comes every day there. And part of the trickiness of this, of course, Hallie, is that the person at the center of all of this, the potential defendant, is on social media blasting out a barrage of different um, inflammatory remarks about the DA himself, just in the early morning hours today, talking about potential death and destruction were he to be uh, indicted here. So obviously, that is not uh, ramping down anything. Laura Jarrett, thank you very much. I know we're going to be looking for more updates from you and from the team through the course of the next little bit. Appreciate it. We are also getting some news late today that key Trump aides will have to testify to a grand jury in another different investigation into the former president. This one about his role in the January 6th insurrection. So you are looking at one of Mr. Trump's attorneys walking out of a courthouse in D.C. today after this ruling went against them. The focus here is really on former chief of staff Mark Meadows, who it turns out is going to have to comply with a federal subpoena, which means he will have to answer questions about January 6th and what he saw and the conversations he had while he was Mr. Trump's chief of staff that day. The judge here basically said, nope, Mark Meadows, you are not covered by executive privilege in this instance. That is why Meadows has to speak. Ryan Nobles is joining us now. A an appeal is all but certain here, right? I mean, that is the expectation on this front. But we can read some tea leaves by the fact that this decision came down from this judge at all. 
Yeah, that's right. And the most obvious one being, Hallie, that this is a criminal investigation into the former president and thereby, if it is a criminal investigation, executive privilege uh, does not matter. And the big difference here between where we've seen Mark Meadows subpoenaed before and where he was able to beat back a subpoena because of executive privileges is, of course, in the January 6th investigation, uh, where the committee, the January 6th Select Committee, had tried to compel him to come forward, but the Justice Department chose not to uh, prosecute him for criminal contempt of Congress because of that executive privilege uh, protection. Protection. This is a lot different because this is a criminal investigation. That is the one area where executive privilege can be lifted. Uh, and in this, there's precedent for this in the past. Uh, the Justice Department was able to break through, pierce through executive privilege when it came to Richard Nixon and, of course, the acquisition of those Oval Office tapes during the Watergate investigation. So this is a significant development. It's obviously going to make the job of the special counsel a lot easier to have these important players in front of him. Talk about the other key players, too, as you alluded to. It is not just Mark Meadows. There are people who may be familiar. Um, I think maybe to vote Dan Scavino, who ran Donald mm -hmm. Trump's social media. I mean, that was a significant part of the equation. You're seeing some of the other names and faces here, too. Yeah, that's right. Stephen Miller, of course, yep. uh, one of his high-profile aides. Uh, John Ratcliffe, who was the director of national uh, intelligence at that time and, and did express some reservations about President Trump's uh, conduct in the days after January 6th. Uh, you also have uh, Ken Cuccinelli, who served in a high-profile role in the Department of Homeland Security. These are all uh, key players involved in this. Many of them, we should also point out, have already uh, given uh, transcribed interviews with the January 6th Select Committee but not all of them, and not all of them because of that executive privilege uh, protection. So this certainly takes the investigation by the Justice Department uh, to another level. Ryan Nobles, thank you for that. Lots going on on that front, uh, on the investigations into former President Trump tonight. Appreciate it. A lot going on also as it relates to weather, because really bad storms are just starting to pick up as we speak, with more than 15 million people in the path of some of that dangerous weather stretching from the south to the Rust Belt. Look at the map right here. The big concern, tornadoes. With warnings, those funnels could be whipping around at like 130 plus miles per hour. The redder the spot, the bigger the risk. So that section right along the Mississippi Valley is what we're watching tonight. Remember, tornadoes are twice as deadly after dark. This chart shows you when the worst of these storms are happening. So Little Rock, Shreveport, you're probably feeling it right now. Memphis, Jackson, Nashville, get ready because you're about to get a lot of rain and wind. The flooding, that is also really dangerous. 18 million people are under watches or warnings, but some places set to see as many as two inches of rain every hour. Rivers expected to overflow. We've seen the worst of it near Dallas with some hail there today. We just got this video into us. And travel backed up. There's a domino effect even now still rippling out after a ground stop there this morning. Keep in mind, it's a big hub. We're going to get the forecast from Bill Karens in just a second. But I want to start on the ground with Morgan Chesky in Dallas. We are just now seeing the storm starting to hit to the northeast of you. The tornado threats, obviously, where you are, it's a picture-perfect day. That is not the case. Just a little further east, Morgan. Yeah, Hallie, and I think that's a testament to the kind of storm we're looking at here. These spring storms originated in the Dallas, North Texas area overnight. That's when that ground stop took place at DFW for about an hour before it was safe for planes to resume taking to the air again. In fact, I had a flight into Dallas around midnight last night. Even that was delayed out of concern for this string of storms that is currently making its way eastward right now. Tornado watches have just expired in Arkansas right now. But we're going to see watches and warnings play out farther to the east as the day goes on. You mentioned flooding, Hallie. We have learned a short time ago uh, that it turned deadly in Missouri, where officials say around midnight there was a group of people, six, inside a vehicle that attempted to cross a low water crossing, but floodwaters carried it off the road. Four of those individuals were able to make it to safety. However, authorities have confirmed that two have died as a result of those floodwaters. Drenching rains, high winds, only going to be a significant concern uh, in the hours ahead. We have some pictures and video from Poolville, Texas. That's about two hours to the west, or to the east of us, rather, here in Dallas. And that is where this early morning storm uh, caused uh, 
significant amount of damage there, injuring at least one person when their trailer was toppled by these high winds. It was so bad there, in fact, we know that crews with a tornado survey team were looking at that area today to figure out whether or not there was a tornadic cell in that area. So this is kind of what we're dealing with, Hallie, these very quick storms that can cause a lot of damage as they make their way uh, to the Ohio Valley uh, overnight. And that is where the significant threat is going to be uh, in the hours ahead. Allie. Morgan Chesky live for us in Dallas. Morgan, thank you very much. Bill Karens, let me turn to you. What are we seeing right now? You previewed about 24 hours ago that tonight this show would be when things are starting to pick up. It looks like that's the, that's the case. Yeah, it's just the beginning. We haven't had anything, you know, horrific or deadly or any injuries or anything like that. Haven't seen any reports of any tornadoes. We've had one tornado warning. We've had a couple severe thunderstorm warnings. But so far, so good. Doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. We're still very warm. We're still very humid. And the storms still have to arrive in the areas that we expect the best chance of what we call supercells in those long track tornadoes. So that hasn't happened yet. If it doesn't happen, I'll be the happiest person out there. But right now, it's still a possibility. So from Shreveport to Texarkana, that's where we're seeing the strongest storm. Texarkana, we're located right here. It looks like the storms are just about over with for you. We do have a severe thunderstorm warning up Interstate 30 heading towards Arkadelphia. So as we go through the night, these storms will move from these areas here, from Texarkana, into this red blob, as you were saying. And that's the area where we have the best chance of strong storms and possible tornadoes. So that's going to happen over the next four to five hours. And then overnight, it'll be a wind damage threat heading through Tennessee and into northern Alabama. But this hatched area here, this is the area we're concerned at now for if we get a tornado tornadoes, that's where they could be strong. And as Morgan was just telling us, we, you know, we have to watch out for the chance of flash flooding. I mean, already one fatality yesterday, and now we're still watching 15 million people on flash flood watches. These are flash flood warnings, one near Poplar Bluff. We've had a bunch in areas of eastern Arkansas all day long, and we could see an additional one to two inches of rain in this area. And Hallie, we'll end with this, because I know the people in Milwaukee probably aren't happy about it. They're under a winter storm warning, and they're expecting six inches of snow when they wake up tomorrow morning from the same storm. Here we are. End of March. That's what's happening. Bill Karens, yeah. thank you very much for tracking all of it. Appreciate it. So in just the last maybe 15, 20 minutes, not even, we have heard from President Biden for the first time on that deadly drone strike on a coalition base in Syria that killed a U.S. contractor. Listen. The United States does not, does not emphasize, seek conflict with Iran, but be prepared for us to act forcefully, protect our people. Pull up the map here. Up top, you see where the suicide drone hit the base. The little rocket icon you see, that's where the White House says a second attack happened, which was, in their words, ineffective. The U.S. carried out its own strikes ordered by President Biden. Those are those three fire icons that you see there. Here's what we know. One person is dead in that suicide attack. Six others were hurt. Five service members, one contractor. Good news, they're in stable condition. And the Pentagon says both attacks came from an Iranian-backed group. Here is what we don't know, however. How did this strike happen? In an NBC News exclusive, three defense officials tell our Courtney QB that a radar that's supposed to pick up on threats like this wasn't working when this all went down. We don't know anything about a goal or a motive here by the attackers. And the Pentagon cannot confirm how many people died in the U.S. strikes, although we just learned they hit buildings used by these Iranian groups. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us now. The Pentagon has been clear so far that President Biden wants the U.S. to respond whenever, wherever there's an attack. And now we have the president as he is in Canada on this... Um, out of the country trip, technically not overseas, Kelly, but out of the country speaking about this for the first time. And that press conference with uh, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, is ongoing. And so it's possible there could be additional comments as they continue to face reporters. Uh, the president is clear that he is not trying to increase tensions with Iran, but is also not going to let actions that have put Americans in harm's way, claim the life of an American and injured others uh, without responding. So trying to send a very clear message that when aggression is shown toward U.S. interests, aggression can be shown back. And so uh, we've given so much attention in the last year to what's going on with Ukraine and U.S. efforts to help Ukraine against Russia. Uh, people may have forgotten that the U.S. maintains uh, fewer than 1,000 Americans who are working around Syria, helping the Kurds there, also trying to keep stability in the Middle East. And it is this Iranian influence that, of course, can be something that can be very unpredictable. And it certainly wants to use whatever power it 
it has against Israel, against the United States, and our interests in that part of the world. So it's volatile, it's a concern, and as you pointed out, uh, uh, the reporting of our colleague, that there was uh, some possibility of some of the defenses that might have protected uh, the U.S. personnel uh, may have been down for maintenance. Could that have been one of the factors? There are many more questions that need to be answered here, but the president was uh, describing in his uh, press mm. remarks a short time ago how he was briefed on the flight to Canada, how he made the decision in flight to take the military action, and that uh, while they're not trying to ratchet things up, if there are additional strikes and counter strikes, uh, we should be prepared for uh, that kind of activity when uh, when there is signs of aggression against the U.S. Hallie? Pull on that thread a little more, Kelly, if you will, because you alluded to this, the president alluded to this, the idea of the risk of escalation. I should note that we've been showing, that is a live picture of President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau that we've been showing next to you, Kelly, here as they are in Canada. We understand the president's been asked about China, about Wall Street. We're going to keep folks posted on the headlines. But Kelly, when it comes to Iran and the risk of ex escalation, when you talk to sources at the White House, how do they see that in light of this strike? Well, officials at the White House and at the Pentagon have been careful to describe uh, the drone that was used as uh, Iranian-made, Iranian-backed, and that is a distinction that means they're not directly blaming Iran. And uh, although there isn't much daylight there, the kind of, uh, of, of distance they're creating is significant because they're not trying to ratchet it up as U.S. versus uh, the Islamic Republic of, of Iran right away at this point. They're not trying to say that this is uh, something where they want to tweak this to make it even worse. What they are expressing is concern about the forces that for a long time have been a concern in the Middle East where the Iranian Re Republican Guard, the more elite military units, and some of the ways that they have been able to use their money and their influence and how they can get other actors uh, to engage militarily and to, to do things that can destabilize, uh, that that's a concern for the United States. So they are trying to speak strongly without going to a point of a spark a larger problem. So it's a case of, in a, in, I think they're trying to describe this as something happened that was provocative, deadly, and dangerous. Mm. They want to tamp that down without pushing it to the next level. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, live for us there at the White House. We're keeping an eye, of course, on that news conference. Kelly, thank you. On Capitol Hill, you've got House Republicans today jumping into the so-called culture war fights over what's being taught in public schools, passing what they call a parent's bill of rights with all kinds of rules reaching down into local districts, from requiring meetings with parents to requiring information be released on trans students. Here's House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. This is not about Washington. This is empowering the parents. This is the parents' bill of rights. It's knocking down currently with this Biden administration that wants Washington to control all, that wants a DOJ to go after parents when they go to school board meetings. No, this is opening up the schools to the parents. Republican lawmakers like him who support this bill say H.R. 5 is about transparency, like letting parents know what their kids are reading, showing how the school's spending its money. But Democrats say this is only going to fuel more of what we've been seeing across the country, like book bans and restrictions aimed at trans girls. Ali Vitali is joining us now. Bottom line, Ali, this is a bill that is all but certainly not going to make it through the Senate, yeah. which is controlled by Democrats who do not support this kind of thing. But it is clearly uh, symbolic from a messaging perspective as Republicans head into a presidential campaign year. Yeah, that's exactly right. It is making tangible the kind of red meat for the base that conservatives have been using across the country, similar to the kinds of things that we're seeing Governor Ron DeSantis make real in Florida through a policy perspective. We're watching now Republicans try to do that, despite the fact that you're right. It's not going to go anywhere within the Democratic-controlled Senate. And frankly, if you look at what some of the absences were today, you had five Republicans vote against this in any normal world where everyone was on the floor where they were supposed to be. That would have been too much, too many Republicans falling off of this, and they wouldn't have been able to pass it. The reasons for those Republicans not going for it, we can get into in a second. But from a Democratic perspective, the pushback is pretty much what you would expect. Listen to Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. <clears throat> Extreme mega Republicans passed a bill that puts politics over parents and will ban books, censor librarians, and bully children. 
So look, Hallie, what you're looking at here is Republicans saying this is all about transparency with parents. What Democrats are saying is that the transparency that parents are asking for at various points during the pandemic, we watch those school board meetings turn very aggressive. We watch right. what's happening in other states across the country, both sides really repeating the things that we would expect them to be saying here, except for those few Republicans, and we can get into why. Get into why. Um, just do it. Tell us why. And then talk a little bit, too, about the other piece of this, which is part of the concern from parents. And I think this goes back to even I think, you know, I say this because I live just across the river, as you do from Virginia. We saw it with Glenn Youngkin here, right? The yeah. idea of parents and education and how do you sort of communicate a message there. But the idea of learning loss in the pandemic, which is still such a real issue for so many parents in this country here. Walk us through some of how those threads interplay to this. Yeah, totally. I mean, look, learning loss is something that I hear about from lawmakers here, and there are ways to tackle that that are not centrally in this bill. But look, some of the pushback from even Republican lawmakers is that this is the federal government reaching into local entities. Typically, that's not the conservative position. The conservative position is less government rules, localities can do their own thing. But then you look at some of the other amendments that were put up for this, and those are some of the other reasons that Republicans are citing for why they weren't able to go for it. Specific amendments like when transgender girls join girls' athletics teams. It's when you start getting into the anti-trans agenda that we're seeing across the country here, too, that even some Republicans balked at here. Ali Vitale, uh, live for us on Capitol Hill. Ali, thank you for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Listen, there's a new warning from the State Department tonight for anybody planning to travel outside the U.S. anytime soon. If you don't have a passport, you better get your application in ASAP. Apparently, there's a huge demand for them, and it's taken a while to process. 10 to 13 weeks for a regular passport, that's like three months. And even if you pay extra to get it expedited, it could take up to nine weeks. The State Department says they're getting slammed with like half a million applications every week. That's 40% more than what they were seeing last year. Tom Costello joins us now. Dynamics at play here, Tom, you have yours, I appear have to be, you know, people getting back out there after slowing down travel during the pandemic. But even while the State Department says, OK, they're adding overtime, et cetera, why yeah. aren't they ready for this crush? Well, I think that's a good question. I mean, but you, you nailed it, as you always do. The bottom line here is that during the pandemic, there was this a drought of people who wanted passports. The State Department has a staff that handles that. They thought, OK, well, let's reassign or lay these people off. And now all of a sudden there's a surge of people mm. who want passports because the pandemic is now three yeah. years. We're through it, hopefully. And they want to travel, right? They want to get out there as the evidence suggests. And so we're seeing this crush of people and state is trying to catch up. And oh, by the way, guess what? Their computer portal system to do it online, it's gone down. I was just going to say, why can't you yeah. renew it online right now? If you have a pass, not if you want to get one, but if you want to renew a passport, right. you can't do it online You're even if you wanted to. supposed to but their system is glitchy and not working at the moment. So, Hallie Jackson, as you would expect, we scour the world for experts to talk to us. What do they tell about you? About this issue, right? What is it going to take? What is your recommendation for passport processing? And where else would you go to get an expert advice on the American passport but a Brit? So listen to Andy Anderson. I interviewed him in the good old UK, and here's his advice about how long this may take. I think it's difficult at the moment to know exactly in the next couple of months which way this is going to go. Is the problem going to get better and, and, and waiting times will come down or is it going to get a lot worse? And so, so, so therefore, I think, yes, yeah, certainly don't book your vacation until you have the passport on your hand. OK, well, the reason we booked him is we love British accents, right? Who does an instant credibility. But what he said there is credible is really important. Yeah. Don't book your vacation if you don't have a passport. Don't buy your, your trip to Dublin or wherever you're going if you don't have one of these things. And he also gave some really good advice. May if you have one, check to see when it's expiring. Because some countries say you can't come in if it's expiring within six months, nine months, three That's months. Point. So find out when it expires and then check the website for that country and figure out when are they, when is that window letting up? You always bring some news we can use, Tom Casella. Thank you so I much. I have to go to the Brits. Keep an eye on that, please. Put that away somewhere safe. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tom. You can catch more All of right. his reporting tonight with Lester. Of course, 6.30 Eastern, wherever you watch your local NBC station. Coming up here on the show, a big shift in how we test for a health condition that affects nearly half the people in the country. We're gonna tell you about a potential watershed shift for diabetes. Plus, when Twitter's plans to take back its blue check marks will kick in, unless you pay up. We're also watching this courtroom in Park City, Utah. Look at it, you can see a bit of a huddle now. Gwyneth Paltrow is on the stand. 
Looks like there's a break in the action. We're going to get to the action right after the break. There's this new survey that suggests people just don't think the future looks so bright for their kids. We'll talk about their biggest concerns and one stat that shows it's not all doom and gloom coming up in a couple of minutes. But first, right now, we just showed you before the break the live shot of Gwyneth Paltrow on the stand testifying as we speak in a courtroom in Utah. She's defending what she did the day of a ski crash at Deer Valley Resort in that state back in 2016. This is a live shot. I want to play for you something that she just said when we went to break. Listen. I would not have left the scene without leaving my information, and my information was left. I, I didn't engage in risky behavior. I, I wouldn't with my children there or without my children there. It's day four of this trial, where the plaintiff, Terry Sanderson, is trying to prove the Paltrow crashed into him going downhill on a ski slope seven years ago. It's kind of a he said, she said. They each say the other is to blame. We're looking at Maggie Vespa, who's covering the story for us. And then, of course, there's Gwyneth Paltrow there on the left side of the screen. It sounds like, Maggie, they have asked her or she has volunteered to kind of reenact what happened here. Um, what she remembers, her version of events, basically walk us through it. Yeah, so they asked her to help them reenact. Her attorneys objected. So what you're looking at, what we just saw off the top there, was actually the plaintiff's attorney saying, okay, we're not going to have you involved in this reenactment. So she goes, I'm going to try to be you and my client, the plaintiff, at the same time. One woman, there you go, going through this reenactment of two skiers colliding. The core question in this case, Hallie, as you know, is who collided into whom? Gwyneth Paltrow alleges, no, no, the plaintiff actually hit her. She says he collided into her, uh, straight into her back as she was skiing down this run in Utah in 2016 with her two kids, her daughter, Apple, ahead of her, and her son, Moses, um, just over to the side on her left, ages 9 and 11 at that point. But the plaintiff, the core of this lawsuit, says actually Paltrow crashed into him, that she was skiing recklessly, and then also you heard her say, I would have left my information. He alleges that she basically injured him and then just skied off. So it truly is opposing accounts of what went down on that slope, Hallie. Um, talk about, you know, what we expect to see when Gwyneth Paltrow's team takes over, because we're roughly halfway through the trial now. I mean, you're looking at the cameras in court. We've been seeing them. We covered this the first day that the trial happened. Because, again, it is really high profile, and there was the question of Terry Sanderson, the plaintiff here, wants something like $300,000. Why right. perhaps Paltrow didn't settle? Clearly, and the, the reporting seems to be that she wants to make the point that she feels she is not at fault here. She feels she's not at fault here, and then her team has also kind of made the point, and she's made this in past court documents, that she thinks this is happening in part, at least, because she's a celebrity, and mm. she thinks that the plaintiff could get a payday from this. The original suit, the original um, damages sought was $3.1 million. So we're down to 300000 from the millions. Once her team takes over, because we want to be clear, she's being compelled to testify by the plaintiff's side right now. So once her team takes over, it's expected to be next week, we are going to hear, we're told, from two key witnesses, those witnesses being her kids, Apple and Moses, right. who, again, were on that run and will testify for the first time to what they saw when this collision happened involving their mom, Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thank you very much for staying on top of it. We'll keep you posted on what else we hear from Ms. Paltrow on the stand. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, four of the five former officers charged with the murder of Tyree Nichols can no longer work in any law enforcement agency in Tennessee. A state panel just voted to decertify, decertify them rather, at the request of Memphis PD. They've got 30 days to appeal the decision. The five former officers charged with second degree murder have all pleaded not guilty. Number two, remember the movie Hotel Rwanda? Well, the real life hero of that story is set to be released from Rwandan prison tomorrow. Paul Rusebagunia saved hundreds of lives from genocide, but two years ago he was convicted on terrorism charges until Rwanda's government commuted his sentence today. Number three, Twitter is officially getting rid of the free blue check mark next month. It means people are going to have to pay a monthly subscription to Twitter Blue to be verified. Some accounts have been kind of grandfathered in for free if they met certain criteria, but no more. Number four, here's something a little different for all those Drive to Survive fans out there. Two F1 champions will be racing in NASCAR this weekend. 2007 champ Jensen Button and 2009 champ Kimi Raikkonen are going to face off in Austin, Texas at the Circuit of the Americas. Number five, an asteroid big enough to destroy an entire city will zoom right past Earth this weekend. Luckily, 
past us and not into us. It's like, they think maybe 200, 300 feet wide. It's gonna take it closer to Earth than the moon is. You can see the track here. Scientists say this kind of thing only happens once a decade. We're learning tonight about what could be a potentially watershed shift in how we address diabetes. With a new study suggesting doctors should consider how old a person is instead of how much they weigh when it comes to the risk for diabetes. That may sound counterintuitive because a lot of people associate diabetes with being overweight or obese. But it turns out focusing on weight is only really useful when diagnosing white people. That's because, as a study finds, every major racial and ethnic minority group develops diabetes at a lower weight than white adults. It's most pronounced for Asian Americans, Hispanic, and Black Americans also have a higher diabetes risk when they weigh less compared to white Americans. Dr. John Torres joins us now. It's not like diabetes is an undercovered issue, right? It affects nearly half the country, either type 2 or pre-diabetic. So it's been on the radar. Um, why are we just now sort of coming to the realization that, that you know, age, not weight, may in fact be the better identifying factor. And Hallie, what's happening here is it's not surprising the results they got here because we've known this for a while that these different ethnicities get diabetes at younger ages, at younger, at lower weights than uh, white people do, like you mentioned. But at the same time, what is surprising is that the guidelines for the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force put out didn't address this. They talked about it, but they didn't actually put it in their guidelines. They did a blanket one saying 35 to 70 with a BMI of 25 or above, that's overweight or obese should get those guys, should get tested for diabetes. But what we're finding out is for some of these groups, having lower BMIs, especially for Asian Americans, can really influence their diabetes. And what we're finding out, like you mentioned, 50% of the country has prediabetes or diabetes. Of that 50%, 83% don't know they have diabetes or prediabetes. 23% mm -hmm. don't know they actually have diabetes. And so there's a huge number of people out there that have either diabetes or prediabetes that haven't gotten screened there. The obvious way to do this is to screen everybody in the age group. And that's why the right. researchers are saying, you know, take out the BMI, just look at the age. The other thing that's important in what these results are showing um, is the spotlight it's putting on uh, health equity or health inequities here in the way that people look at and treat diabetes. Exactly. And that's what these researchers are saying. They said the best way to go away from that is just to go ahead and test everybody. And they actually looked at a couple things, keeping the ages 35 to 70, which is what they're recommending, or dropping the ages down to 18. And they said, dropping the ages to 18, sure, you'll catch more, but you're not really catching that much more. It's a simple blood test, hemoglobin A1C, usually on the average $30 to $50. And so it's a test that they're saying more people should get based on that age, not based on your weight, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. You bet. So listen, a new poll out today finds most people don't think their kids will have it better than they did. A lot of people, nearly 8 in 10, say they're not confident that their children will have a better future. That is the highest number since this survey started asking this question back in 1990. People have concerns, the biggest ones. It's stuff we talk about all the time on this show. Inflation housing, health care, prescription drugs. Let's bring the editor-in-chief at Investopedia, Caleb Silver. A lot of this has to do with the way people feel about their money and the way people feel about the economy here. Eight in 10 people say the economy is poor or not so good. Half think it's going to get worse. That's a big factor here. Yeah, no satisfaction. Now, you got to imagine that the last year of high inflation and a stock market bear market has had a lot to do with that. But this general dissatisfaction about the economy now, where it's going, what we're handing down to our kids. But also, I found this worse. 78% 78 say it's going to get worse for our kids. This is the Wall Street Journal NORC poll. And 56% say college is not worth it because of the debt that you incur and then the trouble making enough money to pay off that debt to get ahead. That's not very satisfying at all. But also this tracks, Hallie, with a lot of other things we've seen. The Gallup polls talking about people being worse off, 50 percent right. being worse off than they were last year. Uh, so this is this general dissatisfaction about people's personal finances. I think it's getting even more amplified in recent days. It, uh, listen, headline at, at first blush and at second and third blush, it just sounds depressing, right? Very doom and gloom. Like, our kids are not going to be better off than we are. Like, that's not, nobody likes to hear that. There is kind of a silver lining maybe here, right? Even though the number of people saying they're very happy has dropped in the past few years, there's the category pretty happy. More than 50% of Americans say, yeah, they're, they're pretty happy. C can we read that as maybe a, a reason for some optimism? Yeah, and I think if you, you know, talk to a bunch of different people, you're going to get this type of a mixed result. This is about 1,000-odd people that were surveyed here. But you see these surveys all the time, whether it's Gallup or the Wall Street Journal. You know, you're, you're talking to a group of people, the methodology is straight. 
but you're going to see dissatisfaction and satisfaction depending on where you are in the income uh, brackets, where you are in terms of your personal finance situation. That's why we call it personal finance. It's very personal to you. But that's, I think, gen a general malaise that I think has grown month after month in the past year. I think a lot of that's inflation and uncertainty about the future. Caleb Silver, thank you very much. Appreciate it. When we come back here on the show, does AI have a political preference? What we're hearing from certain kind of chatbots after the break. A guy fishing in New York City found something so scary he called police. More on that in the local. But first, some conservatives are criticizing AI companies, like the creators of ChatGPT, for what they call liberal bias. Basically, they're saying that the chatbot's answers favor more progressive beliefs. So now, a conservative data scientist in New Zealand is creating his own new chatbot called Right Wing GPT. And there is a difference in answers that this chatbot gives versus ChatGPT, a noticeable difference. Look at this model from the New York Times. When he asked ChatGPT who their favorite American political leader is, ChatGPT says, I remain neutral when it comes to politics or any other subject. When he asked right-wing GPT the same question, their answer, Donald Trump. Let's bring in Jake Ward. Jake, what? You are often, um, you, you often say, and I think it's right, that AI is a parrot, not a genius, right? Like, it's not creating these answers. It's reflecting back a model. But what is interesting here is we are starting to see the insertion of politics now in artificial intelligence. How could that spin out? Well, I mean, Hallie, it is such a problem on so many levels. I mean, first of all, right, you, you have to, of course, remember, right, that ChatGPT, like all of these generative AI systems, are just regurgitating what we have all been doing on the Internet for the last 20 years, right? It is basically just hoovered up all of the things we have typed to one another in that time and tried to find the patterns in it so that when you have one word, it then can predict, oh, most of the time, these words tend to follow on that word. Now, the problem, of course, is that if people feel that they don't believe or trust what that, ha that model is putting out, then they're going to start to try and tweak it in their own way. And that is what right-wing GPT is a symptom of. And so you suddenly have a whole world of people who are going to start to try to, you know, move these things around. I mean, I want to give you another example of the kind of thing that right-wing GPT says as compared to ChatGPT. When you ask ChatGPT, are concerns about climate change exaggerated? It says, no, concerns are not exaggerated. The overwhelming scientific consensus, blah, 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 right? You then ask right-wing GPT the same thing. It goes on to say, the impact of climate change is likely to be minimal as the Earth's climate is highly complex and affected by a number of factors. These are, you know, uh, denial talking points. And so suddenly Suddenly it turns out that if we're going to just be trusting these things, not looking at their sources, not looking at what website they're on, but just trusting what they say as they come out of these apps, it turns out they could be manipulated pretty easily. And I find that pretty alarming, Hallie. And that puts AI, um, you know, very squarely on the front lines of these culture wars. I mean, it absolutely does, right? Suddenly, AI becomes the way in which uh, uh, we're going to be kind of, you know, hashing out the truth. I mean, you know, when I speak to academics about AI and their concerns about it, the word they use over and over again is anthropomorphism, which is this technical term for basically believing that a system that you don't understand is more sophisticated than it is. The, the tendency to just believe AI and what it says, which a yeah. lot of people are going to do, turns out to be in real trouble when we begin tweaking the source and tweaking its understanding of things. I think everybody believed this thing was going to be a neutral kind of, of technology, and maybe it can be, but not if we start playing politics the way we're starting to right now, Allie. Jake Ward, thank you very much. Good to see you. Coming up here on the show, a nuclear power plant in Minnesota shutting down for now because it keeps leaking radioactive water. What does it mean for the risk to people who live nearby? We'll talk about it. We'll also talk about the craziness of stan culture and the dangers and people can take it too far. Stay with us.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, a nuclear plant near Minneapolis will shut down temporarily after water with some radioactive stuff in it leaked for the second time. Officials say the public's not in any danger. They say the new leak was coming from a fix to the original leak that happened back in November. From our Western Bureau, kids in Los Angeles are back in school today after a three-day strike ended with no new agreement. The union, representing thousands of custodians and cafeteria workers and other school workers, they want more pay, they want better working conditions. Negotiations are still happening, but the union's not ruling out the possibility of another strike if things don't go well. From our Northeast Bureau, a let's call it a crazy catch. A fisherman in the bay near Queens, New York, found a, look at this, bunch of weapons hidden in garbage bags. He called the cops and divers then pulled 14 guns, 14 handguns, three assault rifles. You see them here from the water. Officials are still trying to figure out who they belong to and how they got there. So a new question tonight about what happens when celebrity stan culture goes too far with superstars calling out the drama and calling for an end to stuff like online death threats. That is what we are hearing from superstar Selena Gomez today, who's posting on Instagram now that she's been in touch with Haley Bieber, who's also very famous, and who's also been getting death threats. Selena wants it to stop. Long story short, Selena fans have basically gone into attack mode, doing what they see as defending Gomez. They think Bieber mocked her online. To Bieber, it's just bullying that crossed the line. That's why today's post from Selena Gomez is such a big deal. Bieber is thanking Gomez tonight, too, saying we all need to be more thoughtful about what we post and what we say. She includes herself in that. I want to bring in now entertainment TV host Andrew Freund. Andrew, we're good to have you on it. Um, glad to have you on this topic because it's not just about, it's been on everybody's For You page. Like, I have to think it's been everywhere. If you have any online social media presence, you've heard about the Selena Haley stuff. To me, that's not the point, like the newsy point. The newsy point now is Haley Bieber has been getting death threats. Selena Gomez is coming out and basically telling her fans, like, yo guys, ch like, chill out a little bit here. And we see it with not just these Selena fans. We see it with Taylor Swift fans. We see it with Beyonce fans. We see it with BTS fans. I'm just naming a few of the big ones here. They are, they are um, so, so loyal to the person, to the celebrity that they adore. Yeah, and you know, it, it's funny because when I was doing some research for this, I was looking at the numbers and the stats, because I love a good stat, Hallie. I love a good stat. And Us too. On TikTok, Bring it. On TikTok alone, 750 million people have done hashtag Team Selena, and 57 million people have done hashtag, mm. um, hashtag Team Haley. Sorry. Haley, and Team Haley, Haley Bieber. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I kept thinking, like, if those amount of people put all their effort in, like, I don't know, say, getting rid of voter suppression, <laughs> as opposed to Selena and Hailey Bieber, the world could be a little different place. And it is getting absolutely out of control. And, you know, no matter what side someone's on in this pop culture thing, when you start getting death threats because of who you're married to or who you're seeing, it, it's getting a little crazy. And honestly, it has to do with social media and people posting. And, you know, it's OK for fans to be enthusiastic about their favorite artists. But when it gets, you know, to death threats, it's getting a little bit over the line. Well, so to the point you're making, though, like, listen, people can stand who they want to stand. Like, no disrespect to people who are really into Selena Gomez or Haley, whoever. Like, whoever you like, go for it, right? The question is, when it does start to take a turn, um, who does the responsibility fall on at that point? Is it up to the social media platform? Is it up to the artists themselves? Is it the fans themselves holding the other fans accountable? I think it's a mix of all those things, but what I will say, just having done this for a long time, is these celebrities live in a totally different world where they're surrounded by yes people. So they think that whatever they do, whatever they post, it's not really going to have an impact because everyone around them is like, that's great, that's great, you're great. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they post something and it explodes. And a lot of times people are like, didn't they know that if they post this, something... And sometimes they actually don't know. And another thing that I'm finding is it's kind of sexist because... 
it all is mostly surrounding women against women. Like when J Lo started dating Ben Affleck again, did A Rod get death threats? I don't remember hearing anything about that. But when it comes to two women like Selena, like Haley, like Beyonce, like Nicki Minaj, there's something in the zeitgeist about pit pitting women against each other, which I really hope it stops. People need to take a chill pill. It's just showbiz, it's just entertainment. We all just gotta love each other. It's Friday. You know, I'm, I'm channeling my inner zen right now. That's what I'm doing. Channel away, Andrew. We will join you in just about an hour and seven minutes when we're off the air. Thank you so much. I appreciate that breakdown. Still to come here on the show. It is the beginning of the end for a lot of big shows and probably some shows you watch. But does it mean more broadly that the peak TV era is over? We're talking about it. We are heading into a huge weekend for TV that has a lot of people asking if the era of peak TV or big TV is over. And that's because you got a lot of major shows winding down. Final seasons, right, starting now of favorites like Succession, like Ted Lasso. There's that big Netflix thriller, You, renewed for a fifth and final season today. So with all these popular shows ending, you got to wonder what's next. It's been 10 years since the streaming boom kicked off with shows like House of Cards on Netflix, Orange is the New Black. The days of streamers throwing all this money at creators, as some experts say, is over. Darren Karp of Bravo and host of Shaken and Disturbed is with us now. Okay, Darren, so what's up with this? Is the era of peak TV officially over or am I overstating it? I don't think you're overstating it. I think the era of big TV is over for now, momentarily. I mean, you can never say never in the television industry and in the film industry in general. I think there's a lot of new trends that we're seeing. Unfortunately, I do think we are seeing sort of this slowdown of networks, you know, with penny pinching, kind of cutting down on any of the creative things that they're doing in these big shows. I think they kind of want hit guarantees. So there's a lot of spinoffs of Yellowstone and Walking Dead. I don't see a lot of unique creative television coming out into our midst right now because a lot of good TV is ending, Hallie, and I'm very upset about it. Well, you and, like, the rest of the universe, it seems like, what is gaining traction then, right? Like, what is picking up speed if it's not some of these, like, bigger mega hits? Well, certainly the big mega, hit, big mega hits are gaining traction. Unfortunately, those are just ending right now. But a lot of things that we're seeing is a lot of people are spending a ton of money in the movie industry, in the film industry. You know, I think they want to get a little bit of that all quiet on the Western front Oscars kind of grab. You know, Netflix is pouring in almost half a billion. Apple's pouring in a billion. Amazon's pouring in a billion. But again, you know, with th things like Succession ending this year, Ted Lasso ending this year, Yellow Jackets just started their new season, but it's coming down. I think we're going to see a lot more spinoffs and just stuff that's guaranteed a lot of marvel stuff a lot of yellow jack a lot of yellowstone excuse me and just you know a bunch of different spinoffs of the walking dead unfortunately oh, Dar darren carp darren thank you much i'm sure you'll be watching we look forward to you reporting back right here on the show thank you absolutely that does it for this hour more coverage picks up right now We're starting off this hour with a ton of new details in just the last few minutes on that death threat to the Manhattan District Attorney who's investigating former President Trump, what he just told his staff about that letter he got, a note that says, I will kill you, and what we're learning about some of the other threats he's facing. Our team is all over this. We've got their reporting in a minute. We've also got some new video out of Arkansas where flooding has begun. Hail is starting to come down. Millions of people facing this double whammy of tornadoes and a lot of rain, where it may be most dangerous and a forecast coming up. Plus, take a look. Gwyneth Paltrow taking the stand today saying she did not engage in any risky behavior during this ski trip in 2016. More of what we're hearing from that courtroom in the last 45 minutes or so in a minute. Plus, the UK demanding Uganda create safe routes for LGBTQ plus people to leave the country after Uganda made being gay or trans a crime punishable by death. What we're hearing tonight from a top human rights activist. Plus, how AI and chatbots are shaping up to be a new front of the culture wars. What one conservative bot is saying about who its favorite president is. 
Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we have some breaking news out of Manhattan, where law enforcement sources are telling us a white powder and a death threat has been sent to the office of the Manhattan District Attorney, the person at the center of a key Trump investigation. Here's what we've learned in just the past couple of minutes, that the DA's office has gotten several hundred threats in the last few weeks, according to a senior law enforcement official. Security officials are said to be paying very close attention. They are investigating. You can see, you're about to see some things. Look at those like red bags. That's material getting taken out of that office in a biohazard bag not long after that letter was found. It's a letter addressed to DA Alvin Bragg, which says, you can see it here, Alvin, I am going to kill you, with a lot of exclamation points. Whatever the powder in this envelope was, it was determined not to be hazardous. The postmark on this note is from Orlando, which obviously suggests, suggests this thing came from Florida. Right now, both the FBI and NYPD are on the ground investigating. As we're just hearing, New York courthouses will beef up security after this threat. I want to bring in Laura Jarrett, because, Laura, there's another piece to this. Uh, DA Bragg is now sending a letter to his staff, basically trying to reassure them after what you have to imagine was a pretty scary moment today. Yeah, as you can imagine, Hallie, I think that this letter, this threatening letter that you laid out, really sort of crystallized all the security challenges that law enforcement in New York City are dealing with, uh, with news of this possible indictment. Um, and I'm told by someone who actually received that all-staff email um, that he says, I know it hasn't been easy. Um, he talks about the press attention and the security surrounding all of this, um, and he praised them for their strength and their professionalism. Um, amid what is sort of just an unprecedented scene that's sort of playing out there, down there in, in lower Manhattan. As you mentioned, um, there have been hundreds uh, of potential threats that have been um, on the receiving end of this district, district attorney, even he himself um, receiving dozens of um, particular threats directed towards him. Now, the one that um, came in today doesn't mention Trump uh, by name, doesn't even mention the Trump investigation, but the timing of all of this, of course, you, you know, anybody can see what, of course, the message um, is here, Allie. Talk through, to some of the other reporting that you and the team are just getting in here. Obviously, multiple death threats, as you've laid out, more security coming in. Um, all of this seeming to be picking up as there has been increased reporting about this investigation into an alleged hush bunny payment, the investigation where former President Trump could potentially maybe be indicted, and we may learn more about that as early as Monday. Yeah, that's right. And obviously, no one official announcement has gone out, no unofficial announcement has gone out on that regard. We know um, that we expect the grand jury to reconvene on Monday. It's one of the days that they're regularly expected to be there. Uh, still TBD on whether, in fact, um, the district attorney will go forward and seek charges in this case. Um, obviously, that would be under seal if that was yeah. to happen. Um, but Monday is one of the days that they regularly meet. Wednesday is another day that they um, regularly meet. So we will have to wait and see on that front. But security officials are at heightened alert and paying very close attention to this. We know that they've been meeting behind the scenes in recent days, trying to be in the right footing for this to make sure that they are not caught off guard, Hallie. How unusual is something like this to happen, Laura? A high-profile investigation, you've got the DA involved, and you have to also take this in the context of former President Trump just overnight calling Bragg a degenerate psychopath. He's been extremely um, escalatory on the rhetoric here against Alvin Bragg, talking about um, you know, the potential for what he calls catastrophic consequences, what some see as violent threats, essentially. That's certainly the complicating factor here, is that the person who's at the center of this, the potential defendant, is sort of ginning up uh, the heat on this and ginning up the rhetoric, knowing that his followers listen very closely, of course, to his every word. Um, and it's something that judges are paying attention to. We saw just yesterday a federal judge saying that the former president has a history of attacking law enforcement, judges, courts, and even potential jurors and has decided to actually keep a jury in a different case anonymous, given the president's, former president's rhetoric, which is just incredible if you think about um, what he's doing there. So, uh, obviously, all of this very, very uh, critical to law enforcement, Hallie. Laura, Jared, uh, thank you so much for all the reporting here sure. in just the last 90 minutes or so. We're glad to have you on it for us. Thanks, sir. You've got some really bad storms happening right now with more than 15 million people in the path of some dangerous weather down south and in the Rust Belt. I want to show you the map right here. The big concern is tornadoes, okay? Really intense tornadoes, possibly 
into the evening hours. You see the area in red, that's where the risk is highest. And you know that tornadoes are twice as deadly when they hit at night. People aren't necessarily listening to those warnings, to those alarms. They're not being able to get out or get somewhere safe. So what could people expect? If you're in Little Rock or Shreveport, you are probably feeling it right now. Memphis, Jackson, Nashville, you're about to get a lot of rain, a lot of wind. The flooding is also dangerous with 18 million people under watches or warnings. Some places set to see as much as two inches of rain an hour. We're just now getting video from somebody's backyard in Arkansas. Take a look here. That's rain, that's hail coming down. It's looking like a river that's starting to flood. Near Dallas, you've got the domino effect there. After a ground stop this morning, so travel, really having some problems in other places across the country. We're going to get some forecasts from Bill Karens in just a second, but I want to start on the ground with Morgan Chesky, who is live for us in Dallas. Okay, so Morgan, it is a picture-perfect afternoon where you are. It wasn't that way just a couple of hours ago, and it is certainly not that kind of evening just to the northeast of you. Yeah, Hallie, this is a fast-moving string of storms. We're used to this in spring, but every time it comes, it just reminds you uh, how powerful these can be in just a few moments in which they take to pass through. And this storm that originated to the west of us uh, proved to be significant. In fact, we're hearing that officials have just confirmed two EF1 tornadoes touched down in Parker County. That's about two hours to the west of Dallas. And as that storm system made its way through, it caused that ground stop at DFW for about an hour. And we do know that uh, there were several reported injuries, none life threatening, uh, to the west of us here. But as we look to the East Alley, that is really where the big concern is going to be going into the overnight hours. In Missouri overnight, drenching rain swept a car off the road, uh, leaving at least two people dead in a vehicle of six. Uh, four people were able to make it to safety. And we know that right now, uh, that tornado threat, we're seeing watches and warnings come online in Arkansas farther to the east as well. You mentioned the, the threat at night, is especially severe. Uh, fortunately for us, we're getting a break from it right now, uh, but it has been wild to see just how quickly these storms have moved through the area. Allie? Morgan Chesky, thank you very much. Bill Karens, where is it headed next? Uh, went into that area that you showed. You showed that bullseye map with the red yeah. in the middle of it with Greenville, Mississippi. That is where it's heading. So we're, now we're getting to the peak of this event. This tornado watch is going to expire shortly. They're going to issue a new one for this area sometime in the next 30 minutes. We do have two tornado warnings that are out here currently. We haven't heard that they're confirmed on the ground. They're what we call radar indicated. This is Little Rock right here. So the worst of it is just about over the top of Little Rock. This is the tornado warn storm here just down Interstate 30 heading towards East End. So I'm sure the tornado sirens are going off in this area. Area and everyone's heading to their shelters. So we'll keep you updated if we hear anything about that. So again, the storms are Little Rock right now heading towards central and northern Louisiana. So they're heading into this dark red area, which is where we had thought we would see the strongest possibility of tornadoes. So again, that's over the next about four to five hours from right now. And that's in this hatched area in here. We also have other stories with this. We have significant flash flooding. Little Rock is under a flash flood warning and so is southern portions of Missouri. We have 14 million people in this flash flood watch. And the rainfall totals, you know, you get these thunderstorms, you can get a quick inch or two on top of saturated ground. And that's what we're really concerned with throughout the evening. And on top of all of this, the forecast has gotten even worse for our friends in areas Milwaukee. They're now calling for up to eight inches of heavy, wet snow. And that can be dangerous and knock power out. So that's early tomorrow morning here. Portions of southern Wisconsin, Milwaukee to Sheboygan. And then how about our friends in the Upper Peninsula here? Uh, the Upper Peninsula is going to get about six to eight inches. But from Cadillac to Traverse City, this area could get anywhere from 6 to 10 inches of snow. So here's how your weekend forecast shapes up. We're not going to see the severe weather tomorrow like we did today, but we will see this wintry mess heading through the east. It's not a good day to be outside getting your spring work done. It's going to be on and off rain. Northern portions of New England are going to go from sleet to freezing rain to rain. We mentioned the snow. One thing that is good is we are getting a break here in the west. California has no storms this weekend, this weekend but that changes next week. It looks like a new powerful storm will come in Monday into Tuesday, but at least we get to recover from that last big event. And it looks like in areas of the east, we dry out and recover as we go into our Sunday. So that's where we're going to be sunny and mild. And again, we just have to get through the next couple hours, Hallie. Uh, that'll be the worst of it. So far, no tornadoes, no deaths, no injuries. Um, but the next Not four hours is yep. the most dangerous time.
I know you're on top of it. Bill Karens, thank you so much. So listen, in just the last hour or so, we're hearing from President Biden for the first time about that deadly drone strike on a coalition base in Syria that killed a U.S. contractor. Watch what he said. The United States does not, does not emphasize seek conflict with Iran, but be prepared for us to act forcefully, protect our people. Let's pull up the map up top. You see where the suicide drone hit the base. The little rocket icon you see, that's where the White House says a second attack happened, which was, in their words, ineffective. The U.S. carried out its own strikes ordered by President Biden. Those are those fire icons there. You see the three of them kind of in a line. Here's what we know, that one person died in this initial attack. Six other people were hurt. Five service members, one contractor. The good news, they're in stable condition. The Pentagon says both attacks came from an Iranian-backed group. But here's what we don't know, how this happened. In an NBC News exclusive, three defense officials tell our Courtney QB a radar that's supposed to pick up on threats like this wasn't working at the time. We don't know anything about, like, a goal or a motive for this attack. And we have no confirmation on how many people died in the retaliatory attacks from the U.S., although there are reports now that that number is roughly 11. Kelly O'Donnell is joining us now. Kelly, um, it, it was interesting to hear from the president, and I know our own Peter Alexander, who is traveling with him in Canada, got another question into him about what this means with our, about our relationship with Iran, about the risk of escalation here. Talk us through it. Well, Hallie, it's interesting because Peter, at the end of that news conference, was able to get the president's attention. And you and I both know that yeah. that is a difficult thing to do if a president does not want to engage further. But uh, Peter asked the president, with uh, Iran apparently attacking Americans directly, does there need to be more done? And the president, uh, as he was exiting the stage, uh, heard that, decided he did want to answer that, and uh, t uh, stopped, turned, and said, we we're not going to stop, meaning the U.S. would not stop sending uh, a response to Iran for any conduct it engages in, as we've seen in the last uh, couple of days here, with uh, drone strikes that resulted in the death and injury of Americans, uh, resulting in F-15s taking off uh, and carrying out military exercises uh, to damage and send a message uh, that that kind of uh, aggression toward U.S. interests would be met with a fierce response. At the same time, uh, the U.S. is saying that they don't want to turn things up to a level uh, to trip things into a more dangerous zone. So it is about responding, sending a message, but not escalating. That can be delicate and difficult, especially when you're dealing with a longtime adversary like Iran, where Iran has been using its malign influence in the Middle East for a long time, trying to upset the balance there as the U.S has continued to have a presence in places like Syria and uh, the air base in Qatar, where U.S. forces uh, took off from to carry out that mission, to try to keep balance, to support uh, partners like we have in Israel and uh, the sometimes complicated relationship we have with Saudi Arabia, where we have a defense agreement with them. So this is a sign of how uh, events can change quickly. Uh, they can be consequential with lives uh, lost and injured and uh, the president needing to act. So he uh, made the decision on Air Force One as he was heading from Washington to Ottawa, Canada for the meetings in uh, the Canadian capital with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and then continuing to talk about it today. As uh, the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence is putting together the pieces of what happened here and what more do they need to know. Hallie? Kelly, that was not the only headline. That was the biggest one, I think it's safe to say, but not the only headline coming out of the question and answer session with President Biden. Those are um, not extremely rare, but not extremely prevalent opportunities to get questions in front of President Biden here. He talked about China. He talked about what's been going on with financial drama on Wall Street and a lot more. Give us kind of the, the quick headlines from that on other topics. Well, we would certainly always like more chances to talk to the president. Fair. And he was he was talking about China and being frustrated about the fact uh, that the relationship with China is one that is uh, always sensitive. Uh, it can be testy. At the same time, we know that President Xi just met with uh, Vladimir Putin and waiting to see, is China going to do more, uh, more overtly to assist Russia in uh, its efforts in Ukraine, the war it's been carrying out for more than a year now? And the president uh, made a point of saying it hasn't happened yet in terms of China arming uh, the, the Russian effort there. And certainly Russia needs more munitions and more equipment and so forth. Uh, talking about the 
those kinds of things uh, as the president uh, was dealing with questions. He also uh, was asked about things like uh, energy and drilling with the plans that his administration, uh, uh, under some, I think, duress in the sense that constraints yeah. maybe is a better word, of, of agreeing to allow for more uh, drilling in Alaska, in part for some legal reasons that they have to, even though the president uh, would prefer not to do that uh, for his environmental platform. So wide-ranging questions on those sorts of issues. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, live for us there at the White House. Kel, thank you very much. Over on Capitol Hill, you've got House Republicans tonight jumping into the so-called culture war fight over what's being taught in public schools, passing what they call a parent's bill of rights, with all kind of, kinds of rules reaching down into local districts, stuff like requiring meetings with parents, requiring information to be released on trans students. Republicans are defending this, of course. They say that this is just helping parents understand what's happening in schools. But Democrats say it'll only fuel more of what we've been seeing across the country, like book bans and restrictions aimed at trans girls. Listen. Extreme MAGA Republicans passed a bill that puts politics over parents and will ban books, censor, librarians, and bully children. Again, on the other side of the aisle, those Republican lawmakers who support the bill say this H.R. 5 is about transparency, et cetera. Let me bring in Ali Vitale, who is live for us on Capitol Hill. I think we got to give the reality check to folks here. It, this bill is almost certainly not going to become law, yeah. right? This parents' bill of rights is not going to end up becoming law of the land in this country because mm -hmm. the Democrats control the Senate and they do not support a move like this. However, it is a very clear indication, Ali, of the way that Republicans want to, frankly, message, I think politically, and symbolically as they head into a 2024 presidential election year. Yeah, look, this is H.R. 5. It's not H.R. 1, which is mostly an energy bill, but it is a clearly a top priority for Republicans. McCarthy says that they numbered it that in part because you go to kindergarten when you're age 5, but also because it's a top priority for them in what they called the commitment to America, this slate of promises that they made in the midterms that they say helped them win the majority. Certainly, we've seen Republicans especially be able to leverage the education issue specifically across the country to win tight races. The first place we saw that was back in 2021 in the Virginia governor's race. But this is how Speaker McCarthy is talking about it now, immediately after having passed that bill here. Watch. This is not about Washington. This is empowering the parents. This is the parents' bill of rights. It's knocking down currently with this Biden administration that wants Washington to control all, that wants a DOJ to go after parents when they go to school board meetings. No, this is opening up the schools to the parents. So that's what McCarthy says is in the bill. But again, to bring it back to the reality check that you were talking about, Hallie, in just the last few minutes, we've actually seen Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer tweet something to the effect of, there is no chance that this is coming up and getting passed in the Senate. That's not a surprise, but certainly allows Republicans, Republicans the messaging went on this, but also doesn't allow it to go anywhere beyond the House chamber where it was passed today. How are Republicans threading the needle between um, a, a principle that they have long supported, which is the idea of states' rights, which they support in other instances, versus yeah. this on education, um, sort of stepping in with more federal oversight, or at least trying to if they had their way? And look, that's a question that McCarthy himself was asked today. I was standing in this very spot just a few hours ago when he took some questions from reporters on this topic. And there is a federalism argument to be made that feels very contrary to the actual impact of this bill, which is the federal government effectively telling public schools what they have to do. Typically, and this is what the reporter asked McCarthy, that's something that Republicans say should be left up to states and localities. The way that the speaker answered that question, though, was by saying, that, again, pivoting back to this idea that parents need the transparency in schools. That's the way that they're explaining it. That didn't stop at least a handful of Republicans for having enough reservations about this bill that they themselves didn't vote for it. In any other world, Hallie, the margins are so thin that five Republicans voting no would typically be enough if everyone had their butts in seats voting as they should have been today. That wouldn't have passed, but of course, attendance issues on the Dem side made it so that of course it did. Ali, butts in seats tend to be uh, an important <laughs> issue on Capitol Hill um, on a Friday or any day. God bless. <laughs> Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Good to see you. Appreciate it. So listen, right now, Gwyneth Paltrow is on the stand in a courtroom in Utah, quite literally as we speak. She is walking through the moments 
telling a jury about when she says a man crashed into her, the plaintiff in this case crashed into her, she says, on a Deer Valley ski slope back in 2016. She's been saying, I didn't hit him, he hit me. We want to listen in live for just a second here to some of the proceedings. Time of the collision and in the aftermath, you were or were not wearing a helmet. I was. And goggles. Correct. Uh, do you, did you ski at all that day without a helmet? No. Is that for anonymity? I'm saying anonymity. It wrong. Thanks for saying that. And also for safety or both or what? It's for safety primarily, but yes, I like to, when I'm skiing, try to keep a low profile. You were asked about, uh, well, let me, let me back up even further. Okay. Uh, you told me so just a little flavor of what it's like there in the courtroom as Gwyneth Paltrow is on the stand. She has given her account of what she said happened. By the way, that was her attorney who was talking with her there on the stand. Listen to what she said a couple minutes ago. I was skiing and two skis came between my skis, forcing my legs apart. And then there was a body pressing against me. And there was a very strange grunting noise. So my brain was trying to make sense of what was happening. I thought, am I, is this a practical joke? My mind was going very, very quickly, and I was trying to ascertain what was happening. It is day four of this, frankly, he said, she said trial. You've got the plaintiff here, Terry Sanderson, suing Paltrow for $300,000. He says that Paltrow, who of course is a superstar actress, entrepreneur, she's got goop, he says she crashed into him recklessly on that ski slope seven years ago, gave him a concussion, gave him some other health problems. Paltrow says, no, it was actually the other way around. She is countersuing. She is countersuing for $1 plus attorney's fees. Maggie Vespa joins us now, and that illuminates, I think, the way that she sees this case and why she didn't settle, why she is on trial here. Her, her testimony, right. a big development. Obviously, it's getting a lot of attention because she is so famous, but that's also what underpins so much of this trial in the first place, right? Yeah, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow um, in past court documents, and keep in mind, Hallie, this has been going on, as you know, for seven years, so we have a lot to go through as far as past documentation. Uh, her attorneys have alleged that they think one of their theories is that this is happening because she is famous and because she has a lot of money, and potentially the plaintiff here is going for a payday. Earlier today, attorneys were asking the plaintiff's daughter about a number of times that he emailed his daughters, sending them links of news articles that mentioned him, one time joking a subject line of the email saying, I'm famous. And so they were wondering if that's kind of playing into this, the sort of fascination with celebrity. But what we've seen today with Gwyneth is his attorneys, the plaintiff's attorneys, first and foremost, kind of asking if it's possible indeed that she crashed into him, first asking, were you distracted by your kids? You were skiing with your kids. Was Moses, your son, saying something like, mommy, watch me? And Paltrow basically said, I can ski and kind of glance at my kid at the same time without crashing into somebody. They even mentioned briefly a time where she appeared on Jimmy Kimmel and joked that she was clumsy and said, I just kind of run into things. And her attorney said, objection, why is that relevant? And they said, because we're alleging that she ran into our client, point blank. Paltrow, as you said, has refuted this a number of times. Also, when she was asked if she would have behaved recklessly and specifically left the plaintiff at the scene of this crash. Take a listen. I would not have left the scene without leaving my information, and my information was left. I, I didn't engage in risky behavior. I, I wouldn't with my children there or without my children there. And she repeatedly just said to the attorney's questions, particularly the plaintiff's attorneys, just telling them over and over, he skied into my back. Unequivocally, that is what happened. Even at one point, they said a doctor testified that he couldn't have broken his ribs the way he did unless he was hit from behind. And she said, I don't know what to tell you. He skied into me. That's what happened. Pally. Maggie Vespa, thank you very much. You have to think, like, one of those instances where somebody had their phone out recording, like, that might obviously be a key piece of evidence here. But in the meantime, we have what we have. Thank you so much. Coming up, millions of people in this country have diabetes, but researchers say there's a new way we should be screening for it. What you should know before you go to your doctors. Plus, some new research shows you should maybe think twice before handling a store receipt. We'll tell you why coming up in the five things.
Blue check marks are about to change on Twitter again. We'll tell you why coming up in the five things. But first, we're learning tonight about what could be a potentially watershed shift in how we address diabetes. With a new study suggesting doctors should consider how old a person is instead of how much they weigh when it comes to the risk for diabetes. That may sound counterintuitive because a lot of people associate diabetes with being overweight or obese, but it turns out focusing on weight is only really helpful when diagnosing white people. That's because every major racial and ethnic group develops diabetes at a lower weight than white adults. It's most pronounced for Asian Americans, but it's true for Hispanic and black Americans too. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. It's not like diabetes is an undercovered issue, right? It affects nearly half the country, either type two or pre-diabetic. So it's been on the radar. Um, why are we just now sort of coming to the realization that, that you know, age, not weight, may in fact be the better identifying factor. And Hallie, what's happening here is it's not surprising the results they got here because we've known this for a while, that these different ethnicities get diabetes at younger ages, at younger, at lower weights than uh, white people do, like you mentioned. But at the same time, what is surprising is that the guidelines for the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force put out didn't address this. They talked about it, but they didn't actually put it in their guidelines. They did a blanket one saying 35 to 70 with a BMI of 25 or above, that's overweight or obese should get those guys should get tested for diabetes but what we're finding out is for some of these groups having lower BMIs especially for Asian Americans can really influence their diabetes and what we're finding out like you mentioned 50 percent of the country has prediabetes or diabetes of that 50 percent 83 percent don't know they have diabetes or prediabetes 23 mm. percent don't know they actually have diabetes and so there's a huge number of people out there that have either diabetes or prediabetes that haven't gotten screened there the obvious way to do this is to screen everybody in the age group, and that's why the right. researchers are saying, you know, take out the BMI, just look at the age. The other thing that's important in what these results are showing um, is the spotlight it's putting on health equity or health inequities here in the way that people look at and treat diabetes. Exactly, and that's what these researchers are saying. They said the best way to go away from that is just to go ahead and test everybody. And they actually looked at a couple things, keeping the ages 35 to 70, which is what they're recommending, or dropping the ages down to 18. And they said, dropping the ages to 18, sure, you'll catch more, but you're not really catching that much more. It's a simple blood test, hemoglobin A1C, usually on the average 30 to $50. And so it's a test that they're saying more people should get based on that age, not based on your weight, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. You Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, you know those paper receipts you get like when you sign your tip at a restaurant, these kind here? A new report says about 80% of them have allegedly toxic chemicals in their coating. Ecology Center, a nonprofit environmental health organization, says that. They say until most places switch to non toxic paper, maybe ask for no receipt or a digital one. Kind of tough in some instances, but hey, do with that what you will. Number two, a University of Memphis women's basketball player has been charged with assault after she appeared to punch a member of the opposing team after a game. Bowling Green University beat Memphis 73 to 60 last night. We still don't know why this confrontation happened, but during the post game handshake line, there was some kind of an argument that was what led to punches being thrown, it looks like. You see it there. Number three, Twitter is officially getting rid of the free blue check mark next month. From then on, people have to pay a monthly subscription to Twitter Blue to be verified. Some accounts have been kind of grandfathered in for free if they met certain criteria, but no more. Number four, all the rain that's hit California recently has replenished the state's reservoirs, temporarily ending its years-long drought. Because of that, Governor Gavin Newsom today says he will end some of the state's water restrictions. A couple years ago, he asked people to try to cut back their water use by like 15%. Number five, an asteroid big enough to destroy an entire city is going to zoom right past Earth this weekend. It's like 200 to 300 feet wide. Its path is going to take it closer to Earth than the moon is. It only happens once every 10 years. When we come back, no secret, there are some pretty sharp political divides in this country. But now there is a new front in the so-called culture wars and it turns out artificial intelligence is on those front lines. We'll explain in a minute. Thousands of people forced to evacuate in Hong Kong. We'll tell you what went down in the global. But first, we're following another investigation into the former president about his role in the January 6th insurrection. With news late today that key Trump aides will have to testify in front of a grand jury. 
You're looking at one of Mr. Trump's attorneys walking out of a D.C. courthouse today after that ruling went against them. The focus here is really on former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. He's going to have to comply with a federal subpoena and answer questions. The judge basically said, hey, no, you are not covered by executive privilege, so Meadows is going to have to speak. He's not the only one, by the way. There are as many as eight aides for the former president who are kind of under the same umbrella here. They're going to have to answer some questions. Ali Vitale joins us now. So let's just say it. Let's just stipulate an appeal is basically all but certain here. That is the expectation that the former president's team will appeal this decision. Yeah. Still, though, if that appeal is unsuccessful, um, this could be very significant as it relates to the January 6th investigation. It also gives us a clue about where this investigation is headed in the first place. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, this is an argument that's been going on, and we've seen it in different forums, whether it was with the January 6th committee trying to compel these folks to testify. Of course, once the grand juries and special counsels got involved, that was another interesting moment. Now we're seeing sort of the fruits of those fights now, as the judge in this case last week under seal ruled that executive privilege doesn't apply here. You're right. Trump is going to appeal it. He's going to stretch this legal battle out. But frankly, if you're a lot of these key aides, especially Mark Meadows, this is an argument that you've been hiding behind for a while. It's frankly untested at this level. And so now we're going to see the court not just making precedent in real time, but also getting to the people who we know were closest to the former president in the weeks leading up to January 6th and then also on January 6th itself. Because, Hallie, bring back up that full screen that you had, that graphic of all of the different staffers that we're talking about here. These are key people within the former president's orbit. You've got not just his former chief of staff, but Dan Scavino, someone who was consistently around former President Trump, Stephen Miller, the same thing there, a trusted advisor. But then you also have people like John McEntee, who have been with former President Trump since you and I were on the campaign trail in 2015. These are some of his closest aides and advisors, people who, were st who are frankly still in touch with him now, but certainly had all of the inside information to the conversations that were being had at the highest levels of the White House on January 6th. Right gives us a lot of sense of what the information could be that these prosecutors are going to get their hands on. I can already hear people, and I think it's totally valid, being like, okay, so wait a second. We were just talking at the top of the show about this hush money payment investigation. Yeah. Now we're talking about this January 6th investigation. There's also an investigation down in Georgia for his alleged interference in the 2020 election down there and the push to overturn those legitimate election results. Yeah. How do you how, how do you think about these different investigations, Ali? I mean, I, I always use the model of like buckets, right? Like there's kind of yeah. three buckets here. Um, talk us through it because I think this is sometimes a lot for folks to take in just because people have lives. People are busy. They're not living this like you and I might be, you know? Yeah, but also I think it all falls in the main umbrella of like illegal stuff or possibly illegal stuff. I mean, the Manhattan DA's case, if you talk to people who really follow this all the time, they do think that it's one of the weaker arguments just specifically because it's not as serious in terms of misdemeanors versus felonies as you're considering in places like Fulton County and then at the state level in New York, which has more to deal with the business dealings than the financial side of it. It feels esoteric, but at the same time, what it comes down to is that on all of these different fronts, also mentioning those three investigations are nothing to say about the investigation that you and I were just talking about, which is main DOJ, main justices investigation into potential election interference and into the January 6th insurrection. By main justice, separate. you mean the Justice Department federally exactly. based here in Washington and the special Correct. counsel who's in charge of that, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. And so all of those investigations are in the swirl. I did have a Republican an operative say to me the other day, don't Democrats worry that this will all just get muddled? I actually don't think it's about Democrat or Republican at all. It's about all of these different localities trying to do their own investigations through many of them with their own grand juries and just coming out and seeing what they ultimately do. The problem with grand juries for people like us who love transparency is we want to see each phase of this. That's not how grand juries work. All of this stuff happens under seal and behind the shroud of secrecy. That's how they prefer it. But at the same time, once all of this information comes out, we'll finally end up seeing where they came down on the role of former President Donald Trump. I will say, Hallie, if you introduce the politics back into this, this is the baggage that I hear about from some voters, from some operatives who say they feel that Trump is unfairly under attack. That's something that he has well litigated with his base, however wrong or right that is. But it might be one of the reasons why people say it could be wrongly accusing, but at the same time, let's move on. There's too much baggage here. Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Uh, staying late for us tonight on Friday night on Capitol Hill. Thank you, friend.
Some conservatives are criticizing AI companies like the creators of ChatGPT for what they describe as liberal bias. They basically say, hey, these chatbots' answers favor more progressive beliefs. So now a conservative data scientist in New Zealand is trying to push back against that by making his own new chatbot called Right Wing GPT. And the difference in answers that this chatbot gives versus the other one, they are notable. Take a look at this model from the New York Times. When you ask ChatGPT, who is your favorite American political leader? ChatGPT says, I remain neutral when it comes to politics or any other subject. But when you ask right wing GPT the same question, their answer is Donald Trump. Let's bring in Jake Ward. Jake, you are often, um, you, you often say, and I think it's right, that AI is a parrot, not a genius, right? Like, it's not creating these answers. It's reflecting back a model. But what is interesting here is we are starting to see the insertion of politics now in artificial intelligence. How could that spin out? Well, I mean, Hallie, it is such a problem on so many levels. I mean, first of all, right, you, you have to, of course, remember, right, that ChatGPT, like all of these generative AI systems, are just regurgitating what we have all been doing on the Internet for the last 20 years, right? It is basically just hoovered up all of the things we have typed to one another in that time and tried to find the patterns in it so that when you have one word, it then can predict, oh, most of the time, these words tend to follow on that word. Now, the problem, of course, is that if people feel that they don't believe or trust what that ha that model is putting out, then they're going to start to try and tweak it in their own way. And that is what right wing GPT is a symptom of. And so you suddenly have a whole world of people who are going to start to try to, you know, move these things around. I mean, I want to give you another example of the kind of thing that right wing GPT says as compared to chat GPT. When you ask chat GPT, are concerns about climate change exaggerated? It says, no, concerns are not exaggerated, the overwhelming scientific consensus, blah, 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 right? You then asked right-wing GPT the same thing. It goes on to say, the impact of climate change is likely to be minimal as the Earth's climate is highly complex and affected by a number of factors. These are, you know, uh, denial talking points. And so suddenly it turns out that if we're going to just be trusting these things, not looking at their sources, not looking at what website they're on, but just trusting what they say as they come out of these apps, it turns out they could be manipulated pretty easily. And I I find that pretty alarming, Hallie. And that puts AI, um, you know, very squarely on the front lines of these culture wars. I mean, it absolutely does, right? Suddenly, AI becomes the way in which uh, uh, we're going to be kind of, you know, hashing out the truth. I mean, you know, when I speak to academics about AI and their concerns about it, the word they use over and over again is anthropomorphism, which is this technical term for basically believing that a system that you don't understand is more sophisticated than it is. The, the tendency to just believe AI and what it says, which a yeah. lot of people are going to do, turns out to be in real trouble when we begin tweaking the source Forces and tweaking its understanding of thing. I think everybody believed this thing was going to be a neutral kind of, of technology, and maybe it can be, but not if we start playing politics the way we're starting to right now, Allie. Jake Ward, thank you very much. Good to see you. When we come back, being LGBTQ plus in Uganda could soon be punishable by death. It could literally put your life at risk. What we're hearing tonight from a top human rights advocate in a live report. Plus, King Charles skipping his planned visit to France for now. We'll tell you why coming up in The Global. Tonight, we're learning the UK is demanding that Uganda create safe routes for LGBTQ plus people to get out of Uganda since the country just passed a bill which makes identifying as LGBTQ plus a crime in that country, a crime that it could literally put your life at risk. It is punishable by death. Listen. The anti-homosexuality bill that just passed parliament in Uganda is probably the most draconian and hideous anti-LGBTQ bill that, that exists anywhere in the world. This new bill looks like the first that simply outlaws being LGBTQ+. Plus. Uganda already has laws banning same-sex relationships, and it's not just Uganda. It's a crime to be gay in 67 countries. In 11 of them, LGBTQ plus people could face the death penalty. I want to bring in Ali Aruzi now. Ali, help us understand more about this bill, the reaction here from gay and lesbian community advocates in Uganda. 
Uh, hey, Hallie, so as far as anti-LGBT laws go, they don't get much more extreme than this. Identify as gay and you could spend the rest of your life in jail or even be executed. But what's even more incredible is that the bill could affect all Ugandans, LGBT or not, because this bill introduces so many new criminal offences which apply to all citizens. Friends, families and professionals, such as doctors and teachers, would have a duty to report individuals in same-sex relationships to the authorities. It prohibits landlords from renting premises to members of the LGBT community. Uh, you can be sentenced to 10 years in jail for renting a room to somebody who's gay. I spoke to a human rights lawyer, Nila Gosharal. Uh, she's the senior director of law policy and research at Outright International. Let's take a listen to what she told me. They're asking people to spy on their neighbors. They are limiting people's speech. You cannot promote homosexuality. You can't go around saying, I think it's okay to be gay, right? So there's drastic violations of, of the freedom of expression, the freedom of association, um, freedom of movement. And Hallie, the law would also criminalize the promotion or normalization of homosexuality, which means any organization, including foreign ones, that has a policy of non-discrimination could face criminal charges with individuals being subject to lengthy jail sentences. And obviously, the LGBT community in Uganda are terrified, are terrified of being who yeah. they are, living in fear of arrest, execution, mob violence, and even extortion or blackmail from people threatening to expose them. So it's a horrifying situation for the community there. How much does international pressure matter to the Ugandan government, Ali? In other words, when the UK says something like, we demand safe routes, when you hear backlash from the Western nations about this law, um, does it have an impact? Yeah, it has an impact, but I mean, it, this has been on the rise. I mean, which is really um, troubling. A report released by the European International Lesbian and Gay Association says that violence against LGBTQ people has reached its highest point in the past decade in Europe and Central Asia in 2022. We've seen in the United States over 300 anti-LGBT legislations were introduced compared to previous years. Right. So there is a spike in, in, in anti-LGBT attitudes in hate crimes towards them. I mean, we've seen those attacks in Colorado last year. So a lot needs to be done to reverse this attitude. Ali Aruzi, it's an important story. We're so glad you're bringing it to us tonight. Thank you so much for doing that interview and for sharing it with us. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a new segment we call The Global. In India, Parliament booted one of the country's main opposition leaders after a court found him guilty of defamation. He says he will appeal. He's been sentenced to two years in prison because of a comment he made about Prime Minister Modi at a rally a few years ago. The lawmaker was probably going to go up against Modi when he runs for another term next year. In China, more than 3,000 people had to evacuate because of a fire that broke out at a Hong Kong warehouse that started there. There's a lot of smoke. Look at all that smoke coming from the building. Officers on the scene had to wear equipment to try to help them breathe. In France, Paris is cleaning up after big protests over that unpopular plan to raise the country's retirement age from 62 to 64. And because more protests are expected, King Charles of the UK will delay his trip to France. The visit was meant to be his first state visit. A new warning now from the State Department for anybody to, planning to travel outside the U.S. anytime soon. If you do not have a passport, you better get in your application ASAP. Why? There's apparently a huge demand for them. It's taken a while to process. 10 to 13 weeks for a regular passport. If you pay extra to get it expedited, you're looking at nine weeks. That's still kind of a long time. The State Department says they're getting slammed with half a million applications every week, 40% more than what they were seeing last year. Tom Costello joins us now. Dynamics at play here, Tom, you have yours, I appear to be, you know, people getting back out there after slowing down travel during the pandemic. But even while the State Department says, OK, they're adding overtime, et cetera, why yeah. aren't they ready for this crush? Well, I think that's a good question. I mean, but you, you nailed it, as you always do. The bottom line here is that during the pandemic, there was this a drought of people who wanted passports. A State Department has a staff that handles that. They thought, OK, well, let's 
reassign or lay these people off. And now all of a sudden there's a surge of people mm. who want passports because the pandemic is now yeah. three years. We're through it, hopefully. And they want to travel, right? They want to get out there, as the evidence suggests. And so we're seeing this crush of people and state is trying to catch up. And oh, by the way, guess what? Their computer portal system to do it online, it's gone down. I was just going to say, why can't you yeah. renew it online right now? If you have a pass, not if you want to get one, but if you want to renew a passport, right. you can't do it online You're even if you wanted to. supposed to, but their system is glitchy and not working at the moment. So Hallie Jackson, as you would expect, we scour the world for experts to talk to us. What do they tell about you? About this issue, right? What is it going to take? What is your recommendation for passport processing? And where else would you go to get an expert advice on the American passport but a Brit? So listen to Andy Anderson. I interviewed him in the good old UK, and here's his advice about how long this may take. I think it's difficult at the moment to know exactly in the next couple of months which way this is going to go. Is the problem going to get better and, and, and waiting times will come down? Or is it going to get a lot worse? And so, so, so therefore, I think, yes, certainly don't book your vacation until you have the passport in your hand. Okay, well, the reason we booked him is we love British accents, right? Who doesn't? Instant credibility. But what he said there is credible, is really important. Yeah. Don't book your vacation if you don't have a passport. Don't buy your, your trip to Dublin or wherever you're going if you don't have one of these things. And he also gave some really good advice. May, if you have one, check to see when it's expiring because some countries say you can't come in if it's expiring within six months, nine months, three That's months. So find out when it expires and then check the website for that country and figure out when are they when is that window letting up you always bring some news we can use tom casella thank you so I much have to go to the brits keep an eye on that please put that away somewhere safe <laughs> okay. thanks tom so to come here on the show this weekend is the beginning of the end for a lot of big shows out there so is the golden age of tv over we're talking about it So we are heading into a big weekend for TV watchers. Are you planning to look at some of these shows? If you are, they are probably shows, I'm willing to bet, that are winding down, which has some folks asking, is the era of peak TV over? Think about it. Succession, Ted Lasso, they're all hitting their last season. That big Netflix thriller, You, today got renewed for its fifth and last season. So with all these popular shows ending, you got to wonder what's next. It's been 10 years, a decade, since the streaming boom really kicked off with shows like House of Cards on Netflix, Orange is the New Black. Some folks are saying, hey, is it possible that the days of streamers throwing all this money at creators, could those days be over? Darren Karp of Bravo and host of Shaken and Disturbed is with us now. Okay, Darren, so what's up with this? Is the era of peak TV officially over or am I overstating it? I don't think you're overstating it. I think the era of big TV is over for now, momentarily. I mean, you can never say never in the television industry, in the film industry in general. I think there's a lot of new trends that we're seeing. Unfortunately, I do think we are seeing sort of this slowdown of networks, you know, with penny pinching, kind of cutting down on any of the creative things that they're doing in these big shows. I think they kind of want hit guarantees. So there's a lot of spinoffs of Yellowstone and Walking Dead. I don't see a lot of unique creative television coming out into our midst right now because a lot of good TV is ending, Hallie, and I'm very upset about it. Well, you and like the rest of the universe, it seems like, what is gaining traction then, right? Like what is picking up speed if it's not some of these like bigger mega hits? Well, certainly the big mega, hit, big mega hits are gaining traction. Unfortunately, those are just ending right now. But a lot of things that we're seeing is a lot of people are spending a ton of money in the movie industry, in the film industry. You know, I think they want to get a little bit of that all quiet on the Western front Oscars kind of grab. You know, Netflix is pouring in almost half a billion. Apple's pouring in a billion. Amazon's pouring in a billion. But again, you know, with th things like Succession ending this year, Ted Lasso ending this year, Yellow Jackets just started their new season, but it's coming down. I think we're going to see a lot more spinoffs and just stuff that's guaranteed a lot of marvel stuff a lot of yellow jack a lot of yellowstone excuse me and just you know a bunch of different spinoffs of the walking dead unfortunately <laughs> darren carp darren thank you much i'm sure you'll be watching we look forward to you reporting back right here on the show thank you absolutely that does it for this hour top story picks up right now Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.